how did you actually find people to who were willing to do the craziest thing imaginable, which is invest in an independent feature film? Well, I became friends with uh, with the an investor on another film that I was first AD, um, mm-hmm. and we built a relationship. And you know, we were really like, he he said he wants to work with me. He liked me on set, and so. Uh, that that helped a lot you know it helped uh open that door and the lead actor in that movie um we were shooting a uh a sasquatch movie up in the up in the woods and there's no, nothing to do because there was no cell service up there so it was mm-hmm. like you just became really good friends with everybody you're working with and so the lead actor in that film showed us a, a student short film that he had done and i was really impressed with it and i said hey, what are your plans on I'm making a feature out of this and he's like I, I don't have any and so we so we all kind of just being friends and then you know I, I I got him you know we worked through scripts and different iterations and then I brought it up to the investor and said hey like I would really like to make this movie I think you'll like it too and we all just really enjoyed the script and it just was really a big friendship type relationship that we were able to make the film successfully happen that's great. I mean, it's a, uh, I would definitely say it's successful if it made it into Sundance. Did you end up getting a uh, decent distribution deal out of it? So we had, uh, at the time, it was WME uh, handled mm-hmm. sales on Endeavor content. Um, mm-hmm. And so we had some pretty good offers for some things here and there. Um, and we ended up doing a, a deal with Amazon. Uh, based off of their their deal, anybody who gets into Sundance at that time was was mm-hmm. getting a, a a decent distribution deal through through Amazon. Um, now that I think that has changed, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but that was where the learning experience really came into play because the film was, while it was critically acclaimed, you know, like it won an award at Sundance and mm-hmm. people loved it. It it was uh, tough to market because of the uh, it wasn't genre specific and it was mm-hmm. there's it was a uh, quite a few different genres that were shoved into the film and that that made it really hard so you know distributors and sales companies were very honest with us they're like we love the movie we just don't know how to market it and yeah. so from that out that's where I I was like okay I need to focus on making more films that are genre specific and that fo- that stay in that genre so it's like. You know, so it was a, a big learning experience, but, you know, the film, you know, got distributed through Amazon and it was, uh, it was a good experience. We did some, a few international plays for the film just because it was a 90s nostalgic type film. So, you know, it played actually surprisingly well, like in Brazil. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Can people watch that anywhere? Yeah, yeah, you can watch it on uh, on Amazon. So the film title is As You Are. So it's still, still up there. Um, I don't know if it's a, I can get the rent now, but mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a great experience. I think it's a, it's a, a very wonderful film. I think the performances are great. It really taught me a lot about casting as well, because I was, I had a big hand in the casting process. Mm-hmm. Um, and from that experience, I really like the model of always trying, especially for independent films, always trying to find, you know, people that are on the rise, you know, mm-hmm. actors on the rise. So we had Charlie Heaton, who, uh, this is before Stranger Things. So Charlie Heaton we really wanted to be in the movie. And, you know, so we we, we fought hard to get him in the film and he is in. Mm-hmm. And then um, Amanda Lissenberg, before she kind of had her break in a lot of the stuff that she's been doing. And she's a wonderful talent. And so it was a, it was just overall like a really fun experience. And it's interesting casting, you know, younger folks in the films because they're not household names by any stretch. And so, you know, it's really you're, you're focusing on a lot of talent, but who uh, who all is like on the rise. So, yeah, it's it's very difficult to do that properly. Um, but if you can pull it off, it it can really give you a lot of legs. Um, who was your lead in Stranger Things? Uh, he, he was uh, Charlie Heaton was was the co-lead. So co-lead. He was okay. Jonathan in, uh, in Stranger Things. Uh, okay yeah cool. yeah so yeah he's he's a he's a tremendous talent um yeah i always really i, I always kind of felt like he was undersold in stranger things yeah i mean yeah. he's he auditioned he actually auditioned for the uh the opposite role for the so we had two characters jack and mark mm-hmm. 
he auditioned for Jack and you know our director was like yeah he's great but you know I just I'm not I'm not feeling it as, as much for for this role and I was like I you know I just feel like he would be a better mark and so he read for Mark and it was just like whoa like we were like that was such a, a tremendous experience to see an actor just go from one character to the next and just like blow us out of the water and you know he and then him and the director became really good friends and did a lot of zooms and we're reading the script together and it was just it was just a really great experience but it was fun to see that that happened where we we're like let's just see if you can read for this role and, and he just nailed it so that's great i mean uh yeah well i mean it seems like you've got a decent eye for casting because those are two uh roles that did two actors that broke pretty well after yeah yeah um, so good on you for that um do you Do you exclusively seek up and coming about to break or do you try to pepper in some existing names to help marketing down the line? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to, you have to really, you have to look at the films. I think it's, it's really hard when you're talking about independent films, you really have to like nail down like what type of budget range you're talking about, you know, because if you're doing ultra low budgets, you're not going to get big name people to be in those unless they're best friends of you or the director or whatever. So it's it's really like focusing on I, what I've learned is the best way to focus on is the ensemble. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely try to see if you can sprinkle in a few like character actors or people that are well known or that are in a ton of stuff like that helps significantly. But my my strategy now is to really engage sales agents before you make a film and use those relationships to 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 just bounce that names off of them and be like. What are your thoughts on these people? Like, what are your thoughts on these? Because I've learned it the hard way where I've gone out and I've packaged films and then you go to sales companies and they're like, yeah, but these names, they're good, but they're not great. Like, you're not going to get the budget that you're seeking for this and unless you do solely private equity. And so it's, uh, so I was like, okay, well, I was doing it a little backwards for a while. Mm -hmm. Now let's like refocus our energy and say like, okay, well, I'm going to engage sales companies first. We get all the script and everything polished and the decks polished and everything ready to go. And then we go and get engaged sales companies and see who likes what. And that's where you have to really focus on going to the right sales company that, that mm -hmm. focus on specific genres that you're trying to make that fun for. So. Oh yeah. I mean, one thing I've done on that is, uh, specifically geared the bumper talent that's probably not a term but i think you get what i'm driving at um the recognizable names that are small roles in order to help sell the film get them specifically based on the u.s market knowing that if it works well in the u.s it's probably going to carry in a lot of territories and there are a decent number of U.S. territories that will still pre-sale, basically just enough to get your uh, your names in the film. Like they'll pay the fees for that. You won't get much else. But if the rest of your production is with up and comers and well controlled and a good genre, you can at least come back and break even on the European market. Basically, that's one thing I'm doing right now. Um, but have you? Do you do much directly in international sales or do you just find the right sales agent? Uh, I mean, we have done international sales. Like, you know, that's that's usually where sales agents have, mm -hmm. in, my, in my experience, that's where they, they focus on is like, it's mm -hmm. like saying this person does really well internationally. Mm -hmm. uh, the domestic play is something that I haven't really had much success with for the investors. I guess unless you're like trying to do like uh, a decent backstop deal or something, but yeah. um, but I mean I actually would prefer that model rather than the international because I feel like it's it's easier to look at especially with streaming. Streaming has really made mm -hmm. it interesting with uh, you know the algorithms and the way that they view uh, who is who is a, a star or not. Mm -hmm. You know because they tend to work with the same type of actors based off algorithms and then. 
I feel like they also look at um, social media stats a little bit more than traditional sales and, and, and distribution models. I'd say that's, yeah. Yeah, I feel like it's it's interesting with the international markets because I, you know, I've been hitting my head against the wall so many times saying like, like this actor or actress is like doing so much. They're on the rise mm -hmm. of millions of subscribers on these social media sites. How can we not get them out there? And, and it's just the same thing. It's like, that's just the way that the model is. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure it's different for different sales companies, but the folks that I've been working with, they focus on people who are acting in several different movies and using the leads in those mm -hmm. movies. So it's an interesting model, but I do feel like in the next 10, 15 years, I think the model is going to kind of organically change for the better, I think. I hope so. Um, the the biggest problem with the infrastructure that I see right now is just um, a lack of discovery mechanism and a lack of scaling from zero to one. Um, once you're at one, it's much easier to get to 10, but getting that first bit and actually getting into the system and making the creation of feature films your for, your full-time gig is extraordinarily difficult. Um, that's... Yeah, and the, and the model definitely. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sense how it how it focuses on, you know, typically you know, older white men are, are what drive the sales because those are the ones who've been doing it the longest. Mm -hmm. So it makes it really interesting when you talk about like the international marketplace because uh, I mean, it, it's inherently a very sexist and racist system. So that I hope is also something that will change as we're kind of seeing the way that, that content is being consumed and being, you know, uh, being watched by people all over the world. Um, which I think that the, the the thing that I do like about the way that streaming has done it is I think it's broken down a lot of barriers and made a lot of films more accessible for people because I'm a huge foreign film fan. So oh, like yeah. now you can watch so much more instead of like having to find like some weird boutique like film film place around the corner that focuses on those type of movies. Like you can watch mm -hmm. little anything you want, which is great. Yeah, I mean. I agree with you. It comes back down to discovery on that level, though. Um, finding, like, foreign films, there are massive back catalogs all over the place that you can find, but the problem is finding the ones that are actually going to speak to you and are actually going to be, um, emotionally translate to you is a lot harder without some degree of a guide, and I don't think the algorithmic guides are quite as good as that guy who owns that corner DVD shop who you get yeah. to know. But yeah. yeah, it's... I mean, I do miss those days. I mean, I also used to work for Blockbuster for a little bit, so maybe I'm biased. No, I, was, I was always a, the, the kid who was going in on the weekends and then... A yeah. ton of movies, like yeah, I I love the I love feeling the the films and looking at them and reading the back of them. Who made it? You know, there's definitely a different nostalgic era for sure. Um, yeah. I, and now it's like things are so much more accessible, um, which I think is a good thing. But it's also you know it is a bad thing because then some things can get fall through the cracks. A lot of things do, you know. But yeah. I. Yeah, completely agree. Um, 